This is a video critiquing Mises, the prominent Austrian economist who remains uh, a mainstay of neoliberal arguments against socialism. This is the outline. I'm going to have an introduction, talk about his objections, then look at the tractability issues of socialist calculation, then look at the conclusions. The controversy over socialist calculation dates back to a split in the Vienna bourgeois intellectual community in the early 1920s. On the one hand was Neurath, who had moved over to the side of socialism. On the other hand, people like Mises and von Hayek um, put the right-wing case. Neurath had argued for a, a socialist economy in which calculation in kind, or as economists say, in natura, replaced money. And Mises had responded that this type of calculation was actually impossible. Now, what were his objections? He made some striking claims, and if they could be sustained, these would apparently be devastating to the cause of socialism. The dominant Marxian conception of socialism had always involved the abolition of private property in the means of production and the abolition of money. But Mises argued that every step that takes us away from private ownership of the means of production and the use of money also takes us away from economic rationality. And when he's talking about rationality, Mises had in mind the problem of producing the maximum useful effect, that is a satisfaction of wants, on the basis of a given set of economic resources. And this is how bourgeois economics still define the problem of economics. They define it as a technical problem rather than studying political economy, which is the relationship between the incomes of social classes. Alternatively, Mises gave the problem in terms of its dual. How to create the most efficient method of production in order to minimise the resources used to produce a given effect. And he repeatedly returns to this latter um, formulation in his critique of socialism with examples like building a, a major railway line or building a house. His claim is that only the market, by reducing all costs and benefits to the common denominator of money, allows rational comparison of alternative ways of doing things. He asks, how can socialist plan calculate a least cost method of achieving objectives. He goes through a series of ways they might do it and rejects them all. He starts out rejecting Neurath's proposal of calculation in kind on the grounds that you can't add together quantities of different inputs unless you first convert them to a common unit of measurement like money. That is to say, you can't have a rational way of combining means of production unless you can cost all the means of production in terms of a single unit like money. Now, if you've followed my videos and if you watch my video on linear programming, you'll see that Kantorovich showed that on the contrary, you can optimize in kind without money. His optimization procedures don't depend on monetary calculation. All that they require is knowledge of technology and a planned target. And Kantorovich even got a Nobel Prize in economics for proving this, the only socialist economist who ever did. Now, calculation in the next alternative would be the labor theory of value. And he rejects that as well, but only in a single sentence. He says, this suggestion doesn't take into account the original material factors of production and ignores the different quantities of qualities of work accomplished in the various labour hours worked by the same and by different people. This thing about the original material factors of production, well, that's a, a silly objection since Ricardo and Marx showed how to reduce those to labour. But beyond that, he's confusing concrete and abstract labour in Marx's theory. Yes, it's true that concrete labours do differ 
but as contributors to value, all are reduced to the common social substance value or abstract labour time. In Marx's theory, an hour of work counts as value only insofar as it's a fraction of the total time available to society. It doesn't matter if it's expense weaving, baking, spinning, but from the standpoint of social cost, its abstract human effort is a portion of society's labour time that has been devoted to that activity. But behind the scenes, in Mises' objection here, there's a hidden snobbery. It's class prejudice of the educated Viennese of their time, who were in if he was in effect saying, we have nothing in common with mere manual workers. We're of a different quality, i.e. He's projecting social class relations onto economic rationality. Uh, the educated classes couldn't admit that it was just restricted access to education that meant they got paid more than manual workers. In Soviet practice, you had miners paid as much as doctors. And that was either inconceivable to the Viennese upper class or it was such a sort of source of dread that they might be paid no more than manual workers that it had to be rejected to core as impossible. Now, there is the issue of training and aside from this class monopoly which the upper classes had on education there was the real issue of the social cost of education. Now, in those days, higher education or secondary education had to be paid for, so only wealthy families could afford it. But under socialism, the cost of education is borne by the community, and the commune has to calculate the indirect training labour that's required to staff a branch with trained workers. But this indirect training labour is a real social cost and is quite different from the class monopoly price which the educated classes are able to impose in a class society. In the commune, it all comes down to time spent. The time of the trainers plus the time of the trainees. It all comes down to human time in the end. He then goes and rejects the suggestion that the unit of measure be utility on the grounds that utility isn't directly measurable. I agree with this. Utility is just a convenient faction of neoclassical economics and can't be operationalised. He next says that the entrepreneur is absolutely necessary. Uh, you can't have market socialism with state ownership but a market operating on the grounds that the market is essentially the pursuit of self-interest. And this, he says, implies the existence of risk-taking entrepreneurs. And if you accept the pursuit of self-interest through the market is necessary for economic calculation, then it's inconsistent to exclude the entrepreneur and inconsistent to exclude private ownership. Now, in view of what happened in China after Mao, this is quite an astute observation. Once the Chinese Communist Party conceded the virtue of the market, it became impossible for it to denounce exploitation, as this was dressed up as enterprise on the part of those for whom it was glorious to get rich, according to Deng. Next, he argues against the differential equations of mathematical economics as a technique for socialist economic calculation. Now, you have to realise that Mises was coming from the Austrian school, which is the extreme far right of economics, well to the right of mainstream neoclassical economics. The neoclassical economists were willing to concede that socialist calculation was possible because they had constructed a theory of general equilibrium which they said was a universal law of economics and therefore if it was a universal law of economics socialist planners could apply it as well. The Austrian school are so far to the right that they 
denounce um, Adam Smith as opening the door to socialism. The gist of Mises argument is that the equilibrium condition described in neoclassical economics is an entirely abstract construction and it never actually occurs. Now there's some reality to this but it doesn't prove that it's impossible to plan how to make the best use of current resources to achieve a given future output because at this point we're not talking about market equilibrium and if you look at the videos I've done on multi-year planning you can see that there are well-defined mathematical techniques for doing that. He also rejects what he calls the method of trial and error which is probably him making indirect reference to Valras and Valras Tatatonmo. Now this mechanism is what he's rejecting is similar to what a number of economists like Dickinson, Lang and ourselves have advocated for the distribution of personal consumer goods. That is to say there is a market for personal consumer goods and the market clearing prices for the personal consumer goods are used as a guide to the plan. Mises again concentrates on the alleged impossibility of applying arithmetical or we now say algorithmic techniques of comparing inputs with outputs in the absence of markets for the means of production in this case. He's saying you can't just have a market for consumer goods. You need a market for producer goods otherwise you couldn't do the calculations. But that's not true. Let's consider what a socialist planning agency knows. The socialist planning agency can calculate the labour content of all the means of production. It knows the number of labour co tokens that each consumer good will fetch in the market on sale to individuals. And if it knows both of those, it can, can, can compare the cost of producing something to society with the social valuation that the consumers place on it. Okay, so those arguments are point by point refutations. They don't get into the details of whether he was wrong to say that the millions of equations that the mathematical economists proposed, the neoclassical ones he was thinking of, because Neurath is rather vague about the maths, um, that these were so complex that they wouldn't be tractable. Now, as I say, he rejects mathematical ma economics as a method of planning. And if maths wasn't available to planners, then, as he predicted, socialist planners would be stumbling in the dark. But they're not prohibited from using maths. In the 90s, 30s and 40s, Kantorovich and Leontiev, uh, both of Soviet origin, came up with mathematical methods of solving the problem in Natura. As I say, Neurath was, a, was involved in planning during the First World War, but he never wrote down the method that was actually going to be used or that he had used. But despite the fact that the methods of doing the calculations were in the open socialist literature and translated into English and, and presumably into German as well from the, the 1950s, the Austrian school had never really got to grips with this. Hayek apparently met Kantorovich at the Nobel Prize ceremony, but uh, there was no productive discussion between them. Now let's look at Leontiev's math first. How hard are the maths? I'm, I'm going to concentrate on Leontiev methods. Are the practical ways of solving the millions of equations and how long would it take? And I'm going to explain just how easy the Leontief equations are. Leontief gave you a way of deriving the gross outputs of an economy given the net final demand. I've presented this in a previous video, but F is the final demand, O is the gross outputs, A is the technology matrix, I is the identity matrix, and this is Kantorovich's formula Sorry, Leontiev's formula for working out the gross outputs 
O that a plan would need in order to meet a particular match of consumption goods F. Well, let's say consumption goods plus next year's investments. Now, the co most computationally demanding part of this is matrix inversion. So this whole expression here is a matrix uh, because it's a, the difference between two matrices and the minus one indicates we're inverting it. Matrix inversion is known to be in the same complexity class as matrix multiplication. Naive matrix multiplication is order n3, n to the power of 3. The best algorithms, which I've never tried implementing, but the best algorithms will apparently get this down to n to the 2.37. Now that's quite a big improvement, but still a bit slow. Suppose I have, there are a million products in your economy, a million types of use value. Bear in mind that the Soviet detailed plans only went down to about 40,000. Suppose you had a million products. Uh, so n is equal to a million. If we ra raise n to the power of 2.37, we get this large number, which is um, about 165 trillion. Okay? T mathematical operations. How long would that take? Well, I had a video a few weeks ago where I showed how I got my Z620 machine to perform 10 to the 10 floating op point operations per second and it was doing floating point operations per second in matrix calculations and at that speed it would take 16,000 seconds which is about four hours four and a half hours to do the calculations for a million product economy it's a bit boring but it'd be feasible and this was on a second hand machine that I paid 500 pounds for so if an amateur can buy a machine capable of doing it, it's hardly the case that the calculations are, are too hard. But you can do better than this, because the big problem is that the storage space that you'd need for a matrix of 10 to the 12 elements, that is say a million by a million L matrix, 10 to the 12 elements, which is about 4,000 gigabytes. Uh, remember a gigabyte is, is a 10 to the nine, um, assume four bytes per floating point value you're going to need 4,000 gigabytes that's getting very expensive that's not something you can buy as an amateur on the other hand governments can buy that but technology comes to the rescue in this case software technology sparse matrices and iterative solvers we talked a lot about this in our first edition of Towards a New Socialism, at which point we described writing the algorithms by hand in C and using list, list, linked list representations. But if you use modern functional programming system Julia, all these are available as packages, or the same with if you use Python. You just declare the matrices to be sparse and no store is used to solve the zero elements. Now why are the zero elements important? Well most of the matrix is zeros. The other point is that it's more efficient to invoke what's called a linear equation solver rather than do a matrix inverse. In Julia if you you gotta realize that a matrix inverse is analogous to division. So multiplying by something to the power of minus one is equivalent, equivalent to division. But Julia gives you a direct division operator, this backslash here. And that runs much, much faster than um, matrix inverse because it uses a solver rather than explicitly inverting the matrix. And the problem with inverting a large sparse matrix is that the inverted matrix is no longer sparse. So it's not a practical technique for very large matrices. We know that the great majority of elements in a huge I.O. table will be zeros and we, this allows it to be solved in a sparse time and provided you don't do any matrix inverse operations this greatly reduces the runtime uh, and I'll show you just how much it reduces the runtime. Here is some experiments I did on I.O. tables of increasing sizes. 
only went up to 10,000 elements because it turns out um, for running the tests the time-consuming part was synthesizing the large I.O. tables that was much harder than actually doing the matrix do, doing the solving now this is the number of elements you would have if the matrix was a dense matrix i.e. it's it's the the y equals x squared because the number of elements in a matrix square matrix goes up as x squared this is the number of non-zero elements which is growing much more slowly it's growing roughly 1 to the 1.45 this is the runtime in fractions of a second so solving the equation for 10,000 elements took roughly one second a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix you could solve in one second and we have an equation here giving the runtime as a function of the number of elements in the matrix I said it, I had to construct sparse matrices because the published I.O. tables aren't very sparse. They've only got a few zeros in them. But we know that the fully disaggregated tables that socialist planners use would be sparse. So I simulated the formation of large I.O. tables by starting from a real I.O. tables and progressively introduced zeros into the structure by a series of repeated doublings of the size of the table in which I split every industry into two sub-industries with the same total value of output and the same total value of inputs but split between the two columns um, in a way that in some cases one of the industries would use zero input and the other industry would use one input and um, the, the thing was designed to ensure that the total structure of the economy when re-aggregated would be the same. I've given some, you can't look at huge I.O. tables but what I've done is I've reduced every cell in the I.O. table to a dot and if the dot had a non-zero number at a given level of doubling I show it's a black dot. So this is after one level of doubling from an original I.O. table I actually used the I.O. tables that were given in, in the um, talks I've given before. The, after one level of doubling you get this 50% grey thing and as you repeatedly double it gets sparser and sparser and you can do as many doublings as you want. I did more doublings than that, I'm just showing the first few. You may notice it has a sort of repeating structure to it. That's a, an artifact of the algorithm I'm used. That's because the process of construction is self-similar. That means the resulting object you get is a fractal. And a fractal is an object with non-integer dimensions. As I said, uh, the number of cells in a full matrix grows as n squared. And by looking at the plots, we could see that the number of non-zeros was growing as one point. Uh, power of 1.45 and that's a textbook definition of something which is a fractal it has a non-integer dimension and if you look at the graphs you can see that the time to solve the equation here the Julia equation is roughly the same slope as the number of non-zeros and you can check that out by actually plotting the non-zeros against time I said those I.O. tables are fractal and the number of non-zeros grows as a power. It's said to be a power law system and generally you would have uh, the number of non-zeros is x to the a for some a in the region 1 to 2. The ex example I gave was 1.45. Now that's actually the most pessimistic assumption for the rate of growth of the the non-zeros gives you a very tractable solution but it's still a pessimistic assumption 
The alternative is to follow intuitions from random graph theory, which I'm not going to go into, which would say it would be bounded by x, x log x or n log n. This is regarded as just about the best tractability or um, possibility. And I've assumed that in previous papers. Another even better assumption is to say that perhaps the economy is a small world network and maybe the number of non-zeros grows significantly slower than x log x. What are small world networks? Well, they're common in social networks, they're common in airline networks or the internet architecture. In a small world graph, most nodes have only a few immediate neighbours but a few nodes have very high connectivity and for example think of the way you can can't fly directly between any two European airports but if you're willing to go through a couple of highly connected hubs like London or Amsterdam you can do it in two or three hops now how can you measure that well I and one of my PhD students measured it a few years ago for the US economy and to do that we took the most disaggregated econ uh, IO table that the US publishes about 450 sectors and we did the obverse of what my simulated disaggregation did we took successively took the two most similar industries and you can tell which are the most similar industries because the US Bureau of Economic Affairs gives them product codes and it's like a Dewey coding system for books the most significant first digit would divide the economy into 10 major sectors the second digit divides each of those sectors into a further 10 subsectors and the fourth third digit would divide each of those up into a thousand sectors they only actually carry the subdivision as far as 450 um, sectors but you can use these digit codes to say which are the most similar and you successively aggregate column rows and columns based on that and therefore you can get what the USIO table looks like at different levels of detail and you can then plot how many non-zeros there are and you can plot how many additional non-zeros you get for each sector that you get in the in, in the um, economy now this is a, you actually calculate it going from right to left but it makes more sense to look at it going from left to right what you see is that as the number of sectors grows initially the number of non-zeros grows quite rapidly it actually grows faster than the curve here which is the n log n curve grows faster than that until you reach about 200 industries and then the level of growth levels off and it becomes roughly constant so that for each new industry you have of somewhere between 120 and say 160 different types of inputs used by that industry and that remains fairly constant as far as the subdivision goes which is um, 450 so it looks like it levels off and in fact this is a, the slow growth that you'd expect for a real small world network it's characteristic of a small world network you get this property so what can we conclude Even using matrix inversion, we showed that the Leontief method is tractable. We showed that sparse matrices and linear solvers reduce the complexity to order NNZ, number of non-zeros. We have three candidates for the number of non-zeros, which get easier as we go down. Power law, log linear, or small world. An empirical data shows that the US economy is in the easiest of these classes so our conclusion is wrong 
is it sorry conclusions that Mises was wrong socialist calculation is practical and using the Leontiev method it's almost trivially easy these are the papers referred to um, if you want to reference them I'll leave that slide up for a, a few more seconds though I suppose you can just freeze the video